I have these funky Y2K Apple laptops that I'd love to see back running on battery power. Nothing's worse than a laptop with a dead battery. It's not just an inconvenience to use, but it can cause the device to throttle if the power supply wasn't designed to power the laptop without a battery. These iBook G3 laptops were released in 1999 and received only one hardware upgrade in the year 2000. The Blueberry one is an original 1999 model, while the Key Lime laptop is the newer 2000 edition, with Firewire, upgraded graphics, and a DVD-ROM. The iBook clamshell, like the first generation iMac, was a colourful and fun feeling design, different from the beige boxes that came before it and the white and silver laptops that preceded it. It is for this reason I'd like to try and rebuild its battery. Being over 25 years old, you can't just go out and buy a battery. This laptop was considered obsolete in 2007, some 18 years ago. That's so long ago there isn't even third-party battery options. So I'll need to rebuild the original battery with new cells, a process I've never undertaken before. The replacement cells I'll be using for this battery are 2600 mAh 18650. JCAR was out of stock of the flat topped version, so I reluctantly purchased eight of the raised top version for 120 Australian dollars. Every battery's opening procedure is different. Some you might even break the casing trying to open it. Thankfully, while tightly sealed, it's not impossible to open. You have to remember we're going beyond what was ever intended. We're not replacing the user replaceable battery, we are repairing the user replaceable battery. It was never designed to be opened, and for good reason. Lithium ion batteries are very volatile, and just one of the eight cells in this pack can deliver upwards of 20 amps. So if it's shorted out or assembled incorrectly, it can overheat and catch fire, which could not only hurt you, but go as far to burn your house down. To actually replace the cells, we need to open the battery casing. Again, don't attempt this if you don't know what you're doing or the battery is charged. Because this pack is completely dead, I feel comfortable using a metal tool to unlatch the clips and glue holding it together. Before we can assemble the battery pack, we must ensure each cell is at the same voltage. Otherwise, when the two batteries touch, they'll try and equalize, which can cause sparks and even overheating of the battery, which we don't want to do. Thankfully, all of our new cells were at 3.63 volts. When fully charged, the voltage will be around 4.1. However, I wouldn't want to be creating a battery pack using fully charged cells. Confirming with a multimeter, you can see these cells are dead measuring at or less than 0.1 of a volt. So I feel safe removing them without anything going catastrophically wrong. They're stuck down quite well, requiring a bit of force to break free. There are some wires running beneath that I had to keep an eye out for too. 18650 batteries are a very common cell size, used in many different types of battery packs, from older laptops to even an electric toothbrush. However, newer laptops tend to use lithium polymer batteries, which have flat pouches rather than something that looks like batteries from your TV remote. The number 18650 refers to the dimensions of the cell. Once free, we can finally see what makes up this laptop battery. Comprised of two batteries running in parallel, with four of those in series. It should be noted that not all batteries can be rebuilt in the manner we will soon undertake. The battery management system which controls and protects the cells can sometimes be created in such a way that if the battery is discharged or the controller loses power, it will no longer work. Thankfully for this 25 year old battery, that isn't the case, but it's something to keep in mind when reselling a battery pack. In addition to the cell's physical configuration, there is at least one wire running to each parallel group. This is for the BMS to keep an eye on the cells and ensure their charging is balanced. It's now time to get the old cells unsoldered from the BMS. There's two tabs directly soldered to this board and an additional four wires running to other sections of the pack, which will need to be unsoldered in order to get the BMS separated from the old cells.
I thought, why do more work than I have to, remaking the nickel strips, linking the 18650 cells, when I could just reuse the old ones. However, in trying to break the welds free, the strips weren't holding up so well. The first one might have been salvageable, but the second one snapped in half on removal. So it looks like I'm going to have to fabricate replacements. The two connections to the BMS are the most finicky to create. They need to be cut correctly to fit through a small opening in the PCB to connect to the face of the board. The remaining strips are much simpler, a length of nickel connecting the cells with one little tab protruding where the associated BMS sense wire connects. For these, I cut a length of nickel strip and spot weld a small tab on, adding a small amount of solder which will help us attach the wires later on. Eighteen six fifty cells are supposed to be eighteen millimeters wide by sixty five millimeters long. However, the original appears to be a few millimeters shorter, making our standard replacement just ever so slightly larger. That, in addition to the fact that I purchased cells with a raised top, which are designed to be installed in a holder rather than spot welded into a battery pack. So I'll have to modify the case to make the cells fit better inside by cutting off unnecessary plastic pieces in each cell bay. Now it's come time to get the new cells connected. I'll wrap them in tape to keep them together while I spot weld each nickel strip on. It's really important to get everything connected the right way round, following the original cell arrangement as a guide. The reason you need to use a spot welder is to prevent the battery from heating up for an extended period of time like what would happen if you were to use a soldering iron to solder the nickel strip on. The spot welder I'm using here is just an inexpensive Quanli Macaroon designed for spot welding iPhone BMS chips. By connecting two cells together like this, we are increasing the capacity while the voltage remains the same. When we then connect the four individual groups together, we'll be increasing the voltage of the pack. Now we just need to link each of the four sections together to assemble the full pack. With the pack voltage being around 15 volts, with a capacity of 20,800 milliamp hours when assembled. The original cells only had a total capacity of 13,000 milliamp hours, so we're almost doubling the original battery capacity. Just when things were going well, I slipped with the welder, creating a fair spark and skid mark across the nickel strip. My welder fires automatically, so you have to be precise and quite quick. This was physically awkward, as the batteries tended to slide around when trying to weld the nickel strip on. I really needed a jig, but I used some cardboard packaging instead that I positioned against the wall to prevent it from moving. Then propping the battery against it, I could weld the necessary joints. But now that the cells are welded together, it's time to get the BMS soldered into place. It's critical that the BMS is only attached after all spot welding is done. Otherwise, the high voltage from the welder will fry the BMS, rendering the battery useless. I checked the battery voltage to ensure everything was working properly before soldering the BMS into place. Again, some kind of jig would have been of benefit here, if you were doing such a thing regularly. But I managed without. With the battery alive, it's time to get it back into its enclosure, being careful not to short anything out in the process. And with that, we've rebuilt an old laptop battery with new cells. We just have to test it. But as I would soon discover, we had yet to overcome the biggest hurdle, getting the case back together. I opted to remove the large clips from the center because of the extra length of our replacement cells. But even after doing so, it wasn't clipping shut. The sense wires were sitting too high, so I routed them better so that they were properly routed between the cells. 
but even after this it still wouldn't clip shut. I was clearly going to have to use glue if I wanted it to stay closed, but before I do so, I should probably test it. So I held it together with some tape and installed it into the iBook. After connecting the charger, and waiting about a minute, the amber charging light came on. It then took me a few minutes to find out where the battery gauge was in macOS 9 to confirm it was indeed charging. Before it charges, I did want to properly glue it together. So it's out with the battery and time to bust out some glue and clamps to get this battery closed. The original cells were definitely smaller than the standard 18650 battery. Because of this, they sit slightly higher and prevent the case from closing properly. And it appears I'm not the only one who faced this issue when reselling an iBook battery. Busting out everything I could remotely clamp this case shut with, I managed to get it to an acceptable state. It's by no means perfect, but I guess you have to expect that when the tolerances for this specific battery are so tight. I won't be selling this battery or doing this for anyone else, so as long as I'm happy with it and it works safely, it's a win in my books. Installing our reselled battery into the iBook, it's time for a several hour charge and this laptop will be back running on battery power. Once I've fully charged it, it was time to see if all our hard work has paid off. Unplugging the charger, our iBook is now running on battery power for the first time in more than a decade. And we're done. So this is it. A 1999 iBook G3 with a working rebuilt battery pack, with even more capacity than the original one had new from the factory. Paired with macOS 9, using this laptop is like stepping back in time. The platinum sound pack, the rainbow apple logo, it's all just very fun to explore. The reselling process was quite nerve-wracking. Most of us have probably seen an EV battery fire from an e-bike or electric car on the news. They're the same battery cells as what's found in this laptop. Not all laptops today use 18650 cells. Most use lithium polymer pouches which have allowed for much thinner batteries but are still assembled in a similar manner. If you're a phone repairer like myself, you may be interested in my application iTest, available for both iOS and Android. iTest provides the ability to test hardware functions of a phone or tablet, with both a semi-automatic mode or manual mode, allowing you to easily test functions that would otherwise be too complicated without the aid of such an application. These include things like the compass, gyroscope, proximity and light sensors, or even screen burn-in. At the end of testing, you can get a nice little overview of your results and easily share them if needed. It's crazy to see such an old laptop working on battery power. If you have an old laptop with a working battery, it's important to properly maintain the battery when the laptop isn't in use. As if you were to leave the battery to completely discharge, it may not ever charge again, as the BMS may detect it as being below an acceptable charge voltage. Remove the battery when the laptop is stored and charge it between 50 and 70% every few months to prevent it from discharging. I'm yet to complete a full battery cycle with the new cells, so I can't give an exact time for how long the battery lasts, but I'll be sure to provide an update in the video description. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, consider subscribing and check out the restoration playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.